U.S. stocks closing lower this afternoon ahead of Janet Yellen's speech in Jackson Hole tomorrow. But the question is, what do you miss? Investors await Fed Chair Janet Yellen's speech tomorrow in Jackson Hole. We speak to former president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, Nariana Kotra-Lakota, for the next half hour. Plus, Turkey is emerging from the attempted coup, a stronger regional power, says our guest. What's next for its relationship with the U.S. and Russia? And helicopter money is coming to Japan, at least according to Mark Mobius. He sees the BOJ acting after the yen's gains. We begin with our market minutes. U.S. stocks closing lower before Fed Chair Janet Yellen gives her speech tomorrow morning in Jackson Hole. If you look at the industry groups in the S&P 500, five out of, the, out of the 10 groups are higher or lower, as the case may be, because uh, the index has finished down. Materials were the best performers. Healthcare, the worst performers. And for the S&P overall, it's the lowest level since August 4th. Matt, we've been keeping track of how long the S&P has been trading without moving up Joe's or down 1%. This. He's had enough of this, but what, we're now at 34 days? 34 right? days with without a 1% move, um, without a 1% range. So yes, it's quiet. It's very quiet. There's a lot of news, which is the interesting part. We have a ton of news, a ton to talk about on both the macro level and on the company level, but there's just not a lot of movement in stocks or in bond yields. Now, very quiet. Uh, as you mentioned, one loser today, the healthcare stocks, of course, right at the center of all that controversy. I have my IMAP open to show you just that, Joe. Well, first, let's take a look at the big losers here. Abbott Labs, St. Jude. It's interesting that Abbott Labs is down because Abbott Labs was up earlier, yep. and Carson yeah. Block said as part of his trade that he announced exclusively here on Bloomberg, uh, he's short St. Jude, and he's long Abbott Labs because the idea is that he wants to break up this uh, purchase and that Abbott Labs share Holders should be relieved and hence uh, by the stock. Mylan down uh, again today. It had recovered earlier in the day because it's been crushed over this week, uh, but it couldn't maintain those gains as now down another seven tenths of one percent. I've got my IMAP open on the Bloomberg and you can see that healthcare stocks are the biggest losers of the day, but consumer staples and consumer discretionaries to Oliver's point are also big losers today. Uh, quick look at government bond markets. Pretty quiet for U.S. Treasuries today, of course. Uh, all the action on Janet Yellen tomorrow, but modest increases in yields about the two and the ten year. But if you look at that, a little bit of flattening. A little bit of flattening. In terms of currencies, uh, let's take a look at the South African Rand. Uh, the President Jacob Zuma issued a statement of full confidence in his finance minister, Praveen Gordon, but that failed to do very much for the Rand. We saw the dollar initially drop versus the Rand, but then it re recouped his losses and Rand weakened to a one month low. The Rand is the worst performing currency this month, by the way. The second worst performing is the Chilean peso and the peso gained the most in two weeks today, at least uh, as local bond sale prompted traders to sell dollars. And here's something I just learned, guys. Thursday is typically a good day for the Chilean peso because mining companies sell dollars hmm. to raise money to meet payroll commitments. Oh, that's a, that's so in general, part. Sebastian Boyd of Bloomberg News found that Typically, the peso does well. It gains on Thursdays, whereas it falls on the other days of the week. That's a cool one. Uh, let's take a quick look at the oil market. We saw some gains today on perhaps some hopes that, uh, you know, it's all these hopes about production. But today it's hopes that Iran might take part in uh, curbing oil production. So we did see a bit of a gain. I want to go into uh, the Bloomberg real quickly and take a look at some technicals. Here's Brent oil. We have that purple line is the 50-day moving average. The uh, green line is the 100-day moving average. And there does seem to be some risk that the 50-day uh, is going to uh, cross below the 100 and that might be perceived as a, uh, a negative event for uh, signaling negative momentum. So Almost death so, cross-ish. Something, it's kind of death cross-ish, so that was for you. So uh, It's a very keep, sick cross. Keep an eye on that chart for you. All right, those are today's Market Minutes. Let's take a deep dive now into the Bloomberg. All the following charts are available using the function at the bottom of the screen. And I'm looking at Treasuries. We've talked to death about how slow and quiet it is. Here's another way of looking at it. The yield on the 10-year note today and uh, that's that green circle right there at the yeah. very end. It's stuck in a range of less than three basis points. That is the tightest move since back in June. It is also the second smallest range of 2016. The smallest range of 2016 was basically when the bond market was closed right there, July 4th. So all the yellow circles indicate when the market was closed. Right now we're trading in the wow. smallest range since June when the market was actually open. So very little happening in the bond market right now. It's pretty crazy when the comparable is days when the market was literally Exactly. 
Um, I'm looking at my favorite chart, which I do most Thursdays. It's initial jobless claims with the uh, with the non-seasonally adjusted version, the 52-week moving average, and the uh, orange dotted line. This way, you really smooth out all the bumps, and you really just see the trend, which continues to be lower. It's amazing. We're at like so four decade lows, and we still keep going lower. Um, the 52-week moving average of 267,000, the lowest uh, the lowest since the crisis. Just incredibly stable times here. Because so of the, you, I only look at the four-week moving average now. Didn't pay it's all to about, you know, forget the weekly noise. Just look So at the, the labor market is strong. Yeah. That's one of the Fed's two mandates. I'm looking at inflation, price stability being, of course, the second. Uh, here you see um, in blue the Cleveland Fed CPI. By the way, this is 3034 if you want to check it out yourself on the Bloomberg Terminal from our BTV library. Uh, the Cleveland Fed CPI in blue, sticky, so-called sticky CPI in purple. Um, they're two separate axes, uh, so you can't see the real strength of the white line. But uh, Atlanta GDP now, their forecast is showing, and we've been talking about this for a couple days now, 3.6% GDP growth uh, in this quarter. So um, it looks like we've got decent GDP growth, at least from the Atlanta GDP now forecast. We've got inflation that's creeping up towards a level that the Fed should be happy with. Of course, core PCE is still 1.6%. But you've got uh, a labor picture, as Joe showed you, that's fantastic. So if the Fed is data dependent and the data it looks at has to do with its two main mandates, maybe it really should be normalizing interest rates, as Esther George says. That's what a lot of people would say. All right, let's get you to some breaking news now that we've been following all day here at Bloomberg. And Matt referenced it earlier. Muddy Waters founder Carson Block is taking on St. Jude Medical. He published a report today that says St. Jude's pacemakers are exposed to possible hacking vulnerabilities. He says that St. Jude must be held accountable. This appears to be a company that for years has put profits before patients when it comes to cybersecurity. And we think it's important, A, to make sure that users are notified of the risks, but B, to hold them publicly accountable. Muddy Waters discovered the flaws thanks to MedSec, which is a startup cybersecurity firm. So here with us now to discuss this story is Peter Pitts, a former FDA associate commissioner. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Based on what you've heard and what you've learned, what is your reaction to these allegations from Carson Block? Well, I've read that novel. You know, the novel was pretty boring. I think it's uh, a bit of a flash in the pan. James Bond, like you guys were talking about. And if there really is an issue here, rather than picking up the phone and uh, shorting a stock, you should call the FDA. Okay, if MedSec, the cybersecurity research firm that found the loopholes or the vulnerabilities, approached the FDA with its findings, what would it, the response have likely been? Well, they would have been called in to show their findings, to explain how they found it, to vet what the data might tell, and the FDA would take action. But that's not happening right now. Now it's becoming a, uh, a market story. Um, you know, I don't know what the, the Carson Block position here is, the Muddy Waters position, but clearly I think there's some suspicion here that the public health is not primary in his consideration. When it comes to uh, gadgets and the hackability of gadgets, obviously as more and more parts of our lives are going to be implanted devices that have connected uh, via the internet, how on the ball is the FDA right now? Well, I wouldn't say the FDA is on the cutting edge of technology, but they do know how to regulate medical devices. And as medical devices become more interactive, rather than simply interacting with the body, interacting with other systems outside the body, they're going to have to learn and learn quickly. They're going to have to hire. They're gonna have to get consultants they're going to have to really understand what the potential negative downsides of this interactivity is. Yeah, discuss the evolution of how hacking and other cybercrime fit into the FDA's priorities when evaluating products. How has that changed over the past, say, year? Well, obviously, devices have become much more complex, you know, in, even in, in, in recent five-year time period. The FDA really has to reach out to experts. When they're reviewing devices, they want to know exactly what that device does in every respect, not just how it interacts with the heart or how it delivers uh, a, a drug uh, through a stent, but also how it interacts with outside technology. Would you work with a cybersecurity startup firm like a MedSec, for instance? I think that companies that are developing these devices need to work with outside security firms and then share those findings with the FDA.
It's, I mean, calling it a cybersecurity firm, I find very interesting because it seems that this firm, started by you know a former hedge fund employee, is clearly looking to find weaknesses and then profit off of those weaknesses with strategies like the one they're doing with Muddy Waters. Do you expect that we could see any kind of regulations uh, born out of this um, investment or this business model? Well, I think they're gonna have to be some type of regulations, but you don't want regulation by fear. And at the end of the day, there have been no people who have been hacked you know, from outside sources. There's been no novel to be written here. You know, it's all about you know, making, it, making a stock move one way or the other. And I think that's not the way to move forward properly. I, I want to just read the St. Jude's um, statement. Uh, we've told you, we've read it to you a couple of times today, but important to uh, tell you what St. Jude's is saying. And the chief technology officer here saying the allegations are absolutely untrue. There are several layers of security measures in place. We conduct security assessments on an ongoing basis and work with external experts specifically on Merlin at home and on all of our devices. St. Jude Medical takes the security of devices and their data very seriously. Protection of confidential patient and consumer information is a high priority for us. And we will remain vigilant to the ever-increasing sophistication of those seeking unlawful access to such data. St. Jude Medical has an ongoing program to perform security testing on our medical devices and networked equipment. That's the official company statement. And of course, the other big story that we want to ask about is on Mylan. Yeah, Mylan, I think, is a fascinating story. Obviously, this price gouging theme has been one since Martin Shkreli and Valiant. Now, Mylan's under the microscope. But what I find fascinating is that they have jacked up their prices from $57 to $600. Um, people are appalled by that. They only get $200 and, I don't know, $270 from that. The uh, insurance company and um, the, the benefits company uh, are getting $334, as you can see from this chart here. Uh, patients are paying the full $608. It seems that there are a lot more people at fault or sharing uh, the gains from these ill-gotten price increases. Well, you, you, you clearly have to follow the money, but I think the opportunity here, the positive thing, is that the FDA can insert competition into the marketplace. The uh, the thing that links Martin Ciccarelli and Myelin is that these are drugs that are uh, off-patent, but they're not generics, and there's been no generic competition. When you bring high-quality generics into the marketplace, the prices plummet. So I think it's an opportunity for the FDA to start prioritizing these first-to-market generics, and clearly EpiPen, emergency care, kids, daughter of U.S. senators, the president of the company, is going to get a lot of attention. Hopefully it will drive more positive regulatory priorities. All right, Peter Pitts, former FDA associate commissioner, thank you very much. Pleasure. All right, before we head to break, I want to tell you very quickly, uh, GameStop, those shares are falling in late trading. The company's comparable same-store sales down almost 11% in the second quarter. That decline is more than double what analysts had estimated. GameStop losing more than 6%. This is Bloomberg.
Joe Weisenthal. What do you miss? Bloomberg View columnist and the former president of the Minneapolis Fed, Nariana Kocher-Lakota, says we need to hear a credible plan for managing the economy. He joins us now from Rochester, New York. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. So what do you hope to, uh, what would you like to hear from Janet Yellen tomorrow? Yeah, thanks a lot for having me on. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to join you. I, I, I think it would be very useful to hear uh, Chair Yellen's thinking about how the FOMC plans to approach the problem of setting interest rates over the next uh, six months to two years. Uh, I think as of December, what the Fed had communicated uh, was that they were planning to raise interest rates at about uh, at the rate of about a quarter percentage point per quarter uh, for the next three years. Well, I, I, I don't think that was uh, a plan that's, that's, that's worked well over the course of 2016. I, I think it basically uh, is, is pretty much in tatters at this stage. A, a better way to communicate about monetary policy is to, to isolate what kind of drivers are driving your thinking, and then uh, market participants and other interest members of the public can watch those drivers to, to see how the Fed is going to make its choices. So I, I don't think it's a great idea, and I really would I hope that uh, Chair Yellen walks away from these time-based forecasts that we hear mm. over and over again from the committee about how many interest rate increases we're going to see in 2016, how many in 2017. This is not a helpful way to communicate about monetary policy. Rather, what is, what is the committee watching when it gets into a meeting room in September or October or in December? Uh, uh, what's it struggling with in terms, what is it going to be looking at in terms of data flow uh, that to, to help it determine whether to raise rates at that meeting? Uh, Professor, you know, we're at this period right now in monetary policy where there's an extraordinary debate about what really works and what really drives inflation and whether the framework through which we think about all these questions is, uh, is actually an accurate one. And your tenure at the Minneapolis Fed is famous in part because you sort of publicly re, uh, reorient your approach, you were seen as hawkish, now you're seen as uh, very dovish. What pro That's very rare in professional circles or anywhere for anyone to do a big turn like that. Can you explain how that happened and why um, that's not more common in academia, in economics, in the Federal Reserve? Yes. Uh you know, in terms of my own uh, uh, changes in perspective, uh, when I first joined the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, uh, I felt that uh, there were strong forces that were going to return on inflation to target relatively rapidly, regardless of the, of the amount of unemployment uh, or, or slack, as, uh, yeah. as economists like to say, in the, in the, in the labor market. Uh, I think the, uh, as I spent more time in the committee, watched the data flow, um, that, uh, that assessment just turned out to be more and more wrong. Uh, I, also, I also was concerned that just because unemployment was high that there might not be that much slack, and again, uh, that assessment proved to be wrong. Uh, and where did it prove wrong? Uh, there was a lot of work being done within the Federal Reserve on estimating slack in labor markets. There were very micro kind of work. But then inflation just kept on, uh, uh, I was missing high on inflation consistently, and so you have to, to reevaluate where you are on that. Uh, you know, why uh, uh, others don't make that turn? I mean, you know, everyone has to come into these decision-making problems with their own, their own perspective. I, I approach these kinds of questions, uh, to use a, another technical term, as what, what economists call a Bayesian, which is mainly means you've got a bunch of different models, a bunch of different possibilities out there in terms of how the world works, and you're always putting weight on all of them. And then as data comes in, that might lead you to change how much weight you're putting on uh, one framework versus the other. Right. Often when I hear people talking about the economy, they're wedded to one framework, and that's it. And they're going to stick to that unless something really blows up, and then they, they're forced to change. I'm, I, I, my own thinking is a little more fluid, I would say, at all times across all models. And we appreciate your explaining that fluidity. Now, staying with this idea of change in perspective and data, how do you think the Fed's definition of data dependent has evolved over the years? Well, that's a great question. I, I, I think data dependence was supposed to convey that every meeting was live, and uh, I, I'm sympathetic to why the Fed wanted to do that. They wanted to get back to a, a, a world where 
they weren't telling markets way ahead of time where interest rates were, were going to be. So they weren't going to say six months ahead or a year ahead where our interest rates going to be. Uh, instead, they're trying to tell markets, watch the data. I think the problem has become that the Fed isn't telling, providing enough information about what exactly, what data it's watching in terms of, terms of making its decisions. It's just, a, there's a long list of indicators that are, that are in the statement. Um, essentially a catch-all of uh, almost everything that you might ever think about as being, being of relevance. And really, I, I think the Fed would be better served by isolating two or three uh, key drivers in its thinking. Uh, here I'm thinking about inflationary pressures, uh, the labor market situation, and, and downside risks. And I think downside risks are probably playing more of a role right now than they traditionally do in monetary mm. policy, thinking because of uh, how scarce the toolkit is. So if a downward shock hits the economy, boy, there's not a lot of uh, room to maneuver in terms of offsetting that shock. That means you've got to, you've got to act now to try to keep the economy as healthy as possible um, to, to, to ward off any of those shocks. Uh, I wonder what you think about um, inflation targets. You know, I remember um, a time when inflation tar when publicly uh, giving an inflation target and putting a number on it would have been unthinkable. Now, most of the central banks around the world are around 2%. Um, we were talking with Ethan Harris from Bank America today who said um, that it, Fed officials or central banks around the world need to raise inflation targets, but they don't want to do that. And one possibility, one possible solution um, would be just to say, okay, we can overshoot our inflation targets and not to uh, worry the market that they're going to pump the brakes right away as soon as we get close to two. Yeah, these are all uh, great considerations to put on the table. I, I, so if you go back through the history and of, of uh, how we got to 2% as a target, um, you know, Chair Yellen was on the, on, the, uh, on the Board of Governors back in the 90s and was making the case for 2% back in the 90s. Uh, I think we've learned that since then that, boy, the, the zero lower bound on interest rates, which is why you want to have a target above zero in the first place, uh, trying to avoid that zero lower bound, it, it, it's more of a problem and stay, it, than, than we might have anticipated, say, in 1995. So that's a good reason to rethink um, the target. I, I, my own counsel on this is I think it's something that should be, uh, the Fed uh, should really think about this target or whatever its goals are for monetary policy is a collective decision, not just for the committee, right. but really for Congress and uh, to, to weigh in on as well. Right. Then you get more buy-in on the goals, and, it, and, and then you get more help maybe from Congress in trying to reach those goals. Bloomberg View columnist and former Minneapolis Fed President Ariana Kotcher-Lakota, you are staying with us. More coming up. This is Bloomberg.
are back with former president of the Minneapolis Fed, Nariana Kocha Lakota. Uh, Professor Kocha Lakota, you wrote in your Bloomberg View column about this, about the Fed's credibility. You say, quote, the Fed's practice of releasing official forecasts of rate changes to the public every three months doesn't help in this regard. Yellen should dismiss any idea that these forecasts, the dots, have any relevance for the evolution of actual policy. Uh, but it, arguably, you could say Janet Yellen has said exactly that. This is what she said in a 2014 news conference. Let's listen to it. I think that one should not look to the dot plot, so to speak, as the primary way in which the committee wants to or is speaking about policy to the public is large, at large. The, the FOMC statement is the device that the committee as a policy-making group uses to express its, its opinions. And um, we have expressed a number of opinions about the likely path of rates. Uh, is this what Yellen said in 2014, what you'd like to see her reiterate? Is that not enough? Does she need to go further? What do you think is the failure still on messaging regarding the dots? Yeah, I think, you know, what she said then, I, I, I uh, uh, certainly uh, associate myself with, and I thought those were really strong words. But like every message, it's something that uh, bears repeating and continual re uh, reiteration, I think. Um, one of the challenges that Fed officials face, and I, I know this from my own experience, is that uh, market participants uh, often ask the question, well, are you going to raise rates in September? Or, or how many times will rates mm. go up in, in 2016? And so then you become uh, boxed into to communicating through that, that, that framing. And the, yes, the summary of economic projections, the dot plots, don't, doesn't help in that regard. Um, but I think whatever she can say to get away from a time-dependent, a calendar-dependent framing of policy and get the committee back to talking about drivers for decision-making, uh, I think would be really valuable. Uh, real quickly, there's going to be a huge debate this week at Jackson Hole about the neutral rate productivity. What's your view on that? <laughs> I guess, that's a that, like, teacher. That's probably teacher too course open-ended. On and unfortunately, I don't think we actually have the time to get an answer. I wish we did. Uh, okay. Bloomberg View columnist and former Minneapolis Fed President Nariana Kocha Lakota. Sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry for just throwing. Good that question. Out. Big, yeah. big question. Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> throwing out there. Really appreciate you coming on. And of course, Bloomberg will have much more coverage from the Jackson Hole Economic Symposium tomorrow, where we'll break down Yellen's much-anticipated speech at 10 a.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. London. Also, gonna, don't miss some of the biggest voices on Bloomberg tomorrow as well. We're going to keep, we're gonna keep uh, Professor Coach Lakota, and we'll ask him oh. Joe's big question on the other Perfect. side of this break. Oh, this is Bloomberg.
I'm Mark Crumpton. Let's get to first word news. In Italy, rescue crews are using their bare hands in some cases to search for survivors from Wednesday's killer earthquake. At least 250 people died. Hundreds more were injured. There were more aftershocks today. The quake flattened three central towns in Italy. Many of the buildings in the region were built hundreds of years ago and weren't retrofitted to withstand earthquakes. Colombia's president has declared a ceasefire against the rebel movement starting next week. This comes after the country reached an agreement with Marxist rebels to end a five-decade-long war that's killed hundreds of thousands of people. The rebels, known as the FARC, will convert into a legal political party. It will be guaranteed seats in both houses of the Colombian Congress for a time. Voters will approve or reject the deal on October 2nd. Russian President Vladimir Putin today ordered snap military drills on land and sea. The exercises will last until the end of the month and involve a variety of soldiers, from paratroopers to the northern fleet. The drills come a week after President Putin criticized Ukraine for allegedly carrying out acts of sabotage in Russia-annexed Crimea. President Obama has gone where no U.S. president has before, into virtual reality. He's narrating a 360-degree representation of Yosemite National Park. National Geographic teamed up with Facebook's Oculus Studios and VR specialists Felix and Paul Studios to produce the free video. It's out today to mark the centennial of the National Park Service. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Joe? We're we are still with Bloomberg View columnist and the former uh, former president of the Minneapolis Fed, Nariana Kocher-Lakota. He joins us now from Rochester, New York. He's back, and he's had time to think about the big question. <laughs> so, Professor, um, I always like to ask economists what their neutral real rate is, to plug into my Taylor Rule model on the Bloomberg. More and more people are saying the equilibrium rate is coming down and is lower than we may have thought. Um, do you agree, and, and what do you, where do you think it is? Yeah, so I, I won't answer the second question about where do I think it is, because I'm not a huge fan of the Taylor rule in general, and so I, I think that's not the best way to frame monetary policy. But I, I will answer your question about what, uh, the neutral rule rate and, 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 and the, the forces on it. Uh, you know, I, I, you see a slight downward trend in the neutral rate, I think, um, say from about 1980s in, leading into the Great Recession, leading into 2007. But really, since 2007, you, you see a very sharp decline in that. And one way to, one way to gauge it is I, I like to use market evidence on this and that where markets think real interest rates, net of inflation interest rates are going to be 20 to 30, uh, 30 years out, 10 to 20 years out, is much lower than where they thought they were going to be in 2007, uh, something like 150 basis points lower. Uh, that, that creates a lot of challenges for monetary policy. Uh, you're just more likely, if you keep the same inflation target, uh, your, more, your, your long run uh, nominal interest rates, uh, uh, your, the, the, or the Fed funds rate, is more likely to, to be low and you're more likely to run into the zero lower bound when, when shocks hit. So that fall in where the neutral real rate is, I would say uh, you see in market data evidence that's fallen by about 150 basis points since the beginning of the Great Recession. That will create challenges for monetary policymakers if the, uh, the goals remain the same. Uh, Professor, if you don't like the Taylor rule, do you have another model we could use because this data dependency thing doesn't seem to be working out very well? <laughs> I think, no, I'm a, I think the better way to frame it is outlook dependent. I think that um, you've got your outlook for uh, your, your mandate variables, mandated variables, uh, inflation and employment. Employment's a little harder to measure, and so it's, uh, I admit that there, there's a, little more, a few more challenges in terms of exactly how you measure uh, where we are in, the, on the, uh, on the, uh, in terms of how we're doing on the employment mandate. But then uh, you're trying to, trying to get interest rates set so that you're going to get back to inflation, the inflation goal, 2%, as rapidly as possible, and get back to max employment as rapidly as possible. By rapidly as possible, I generally mean within about a year or two. Uh, you talk um, about you. And that's. Oh yeah, keep going. Go ahead. 
Okay, you talk about no, using right, market um, market measures to derive some sort of anticipation of inflation. Critics would say that the Fed itself is influencing these market measures, that the fact that it's 2016 and the Fed has been so slow to raise rates is itself a signal and that there is perhaps this feedback loop. And so that if the Fed were to put too much emphasis on these market measures, they're ultimately looking at something influenced by the Fed itself. Are you confident that these indicators are independent enough signal that the Fed should be looking at them? Yeah, I, I, I re remain very confident in that. I, I, I think that the, the feedback loop you're pointing to is one of, of theoretical interest, and it's certainly one that gets a lot of excitement and attention in, in the academic circles in which, in which I'm now moving. But it's not something I don't think that, that policymakers, uh, certainly in the U.S., have to be concerned about. The, doubt, the slide we've seen in longer-term uh, market-based measures, inflation expectations, over the uh, pa uh, past uh, three years are really associated with the fact that the Fed has been tightening monetary policy um, while inflation remains low. So it, it seems to be uh, taking steps to slow the return of inflation to target, and I think that's created uh, quite reasonable doubts about uh, the Fed's level of commitment to its 2% uh, inflation target. All right, Bloomberg View columnist and the former Minneapolis Fed president, Nariana Kotra-Lakota, thank you so much for staying with us. And we'll have much more coverage from Jackson Hole tomorrow. We're going to break down Yellen's speech in the morning, and also we've got some of the biggest voices on Bloomberg tomorrow as well. You've got Jim Bullard, Robert Kaplan, Dennis Lockhart, and Jerome Powell. What'd you miss? Turkey came out more stable from the attempted coup than it was before. That's according to our next guest. What's next for their relationship with the United States and Russia? Vice President Joe Biden was in Ankara yesterday expressing unwavering support from the U.S. The United States government is committed to do everything we can to help your government, Mr. Prime Minister, to bring those to justice who are responsible for the coup attempt. Let's bring in Geopolitical Futures founder and chairman George Friedman. George, if you're a conspiracy theorist, this is really entertaining to watch because it would appear then to you that um, this coup was planned for this very purpose. I mean, uh, they didn't do a very good job if it wasn't, and they sure arrested a lot of people afterwards. Well, it's pretty clear that there was a coup. And like many coups, they were led by incompetence. And Erdogan has latched on to this event brilliantly to stabilize his own internal position and rearrange some of his international relations. Not so radically that he's going to be a Russian ally, but he's certainly brought the United States back into a relationship that he wants. But the only conspiracy there was was the gang that couldn't shoot straight, uh, the people staging a coup that couldn't get it done. They couldn't get it done. I want to go back to that idea of the alliance between Turkey and Russia. What does Turkey get out of it, and how does it play it off uh, its alliance with the U.S.? Well, what Turkey got out of playing with Russia was leverage against the United States. Uh, Turkey wanted a number of things from the United States, uh, among which were the delivery of this guy, Gulen, who's in the United States, who the Turks accuse of having started the coup. Uh, remember that just before this coup, Russia and Turkey almost went to war over the Turkish shootdown of a Russian plane. Suddenly, there was a love affair, and suddenly the United States had to start reorienting itself because it needed Turkey. But on the other hand, Turkey needs the United States because uh, Russia is a historic enemy of Turkey. It's really close. It's really a competitor in the Black Sea. It needs the United States there. But I think the Turks managed to rearrange the entire relation with the United States and turn somewhat better than it does. Do you think that it's uh, wise for the U.S., though, to so closely ally itself with the Erdogan government? I mean, do we really share value systems or just it doesn't matter? Well, I don't know about value systems. We certainly share an interest in making sure that Russian access to the Mediterranean is controlled. That means controlling the Bosphorus, and that means working with Turkey. Um, it really depends on what you want. If you only want to ally with people who are like you, the Canadians are right there, and we can be friends forever. What if about, George, what about ISIS? Because it does seem, 
we've seen reports, at least, um, that in the past, um, Erdogan's government has supported ISIS. Now, of course, it's going after them. Um, but don't you want an ally that doesn't support terrorists just because he hates his neighbor? Stalin once supported Hitler, then he became our ally. Look, you play the hand you're dealt today. Whatever Turkey was doing in the past, and it really was not nearly as clear as the media made it out to be, whatever it was doing in the past, right now the United States' position in Syria is extremely weak because of the Russians and because they haven't done very well in building an alliance on our side. Uh, the Turks coming into Syria helps the United States. Any help they can give us against ISIS helps the United States. It blocks the Russians to some extent. So ISIS is one of the issues. Russia is an other issue. The Assad regime is a third issue. Uh, this is not a two-sided issue. There are lots of players, and Turkey helps us with a lot of them. Right, a multidimensional chess game, as a lot of people would liken it. Um, uh, George, talk to us a little bit about Turkey's influence within the Middle East, within its region. It's certainly on the ascendant, but uh, talk about its relationship with Israel versus Saudi Arabia versus some of the other big players. Well, in the middle of all this, Turkey reopened relations with the Israelis and has been cooperating extensively. Another reason the United States likes them right now. It is the leading Sunni power of the area. Aside from Indonesia, it has the largest GDP of any Muslim country in the world. A substantial army, not as big as it was a few weeks ago, but substantial. If there is going to be stabilization in the Middle East, it is not going to be done by the United States. The United States is not going to go to war against ISIS on large scale. If there's stabilization, the Turks will play a leading role in it. Neither the Americans nor the Russians have the manpower. So Turkey is on the ascendance, and in the long run, it is going to return to the situation it was in 100 years ago, where it was the dominant power of the Middle East, simply by default. All right, George Friedman of Geopolitical Futures, thank you very much for joining us. Coming up, Hillary Clinton says Donald Trump has built his campaign on prejudice and paranoia. Her comments next. This is Bloomberg.
Scarlett Fu. It is time for the Bloomberg Business Flash. A look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. GameStop, the video game retailer that is expanding into mobile phones and collectibles, posted second quarter sales that missed analyst estimates in a tough quarter when there are fewer new titles. Sales declined more than 7% to $1.6 billion in the period. Shares are down in after hours trading. The European Union's campaign to crack down on tax avoidance by multinationals has drawn unusually public criticism from the U.S., which says American companies are being unfairly targeted. The EU Executive Commission responded with a sharp denial today, insisting it is being fair as it goes after corporate tax dodging. And Facebook is laying the groundwork for the free messaging service WhatsApp to start making money. It is easing privacy rules so data can be used for Facebook advertising and also allowing businesses to message just more than 1 billion users. This is the first step towards generating profits from the platform since Facebook purchased the app for $22 billion in 2014. And that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. What'd you miss? Hillary Clinton responds to Donald Trump's bigot accusation at a rally in Reno, Nevada today. She launched a raft of charges against her Republican rival. From the start, Donald Trump has built his campaign on prejudice and paranoia. He is taking hate groups mainstream and helping a radical fringe take over the Republican Party. His disregard for the values that make our country great is profoundly dangerous. Joining us for more is Bloomberg uh, politics correspondent Margaret Taleb. Uh, Margaret, thanks so much for your time again today. Um, so Hillary Clinton's job doesn't look terribly difficult, uh, but Donald Trump's does. Why is he calling her a bigot? Well, look. Part of this is him attempting to get kind of off of the defense on this issue and to reach out maybe to African-American voters, but very likely to white American voters who feel very uneasy about questions about whether or not his campaign tactics are sort of uh, have, have racist overtones or marginalizing. And what he's been attempting to do in the last couple of days is kind of turn things around on her and say, uh, you know, that... Uh, She's not either not paying enough attention to African Americans or uh, treating African Americans as victims, that sort of thing. He's trying to turn the narrative around. And what we saw today was uh, this sort of very forceful, not even defense of her own practices, just her going directly after Donald Trump on what she sees as a, a sort of a slew on many levels of. Uh, questionable affiliations, behavior statements, policies, and so on and so forth. Margaret, I think those of us who are online all the time have seen what she's talking about for a long time, the so-called alt-right, the, um, you know, all of the sort of fringe elements that she's spotlighted. Uh, is it safe to assume that many voters are completely unfamiliar with what a Breitbart.com is like or with what some of these characters have said about Trump and that this speech is an opportunity to sort of get the media showing this, uh, this side of his movement to the general public? Yeah, I think absolutely that's right. There was a turning point about a week ago when uh, Trump announced the hire of Steve Bannon when the Clinton campaign began to talk more seriously about what they needed to do, should do to address this, how to take advantage of it or to mark the moment and when to do it. And you always see Labor Day as this sort of point in an election cycle when voters turn away from vacation, they get back home to the reality of sending their kids back to school, getting back to work themselves, and inevitably focusing on the election. So that's always been a turning point where you would expect to see uh, both Clinton and Trump ratchet up their campaigns. But it was the bringing on of Steve Bannon within the last week and, and everything that that brought along with it, the reaction from many of these groups, including the alt-right movement, it, it was just sort of there on the table. And uh, sure enough, with all of this focus on the Clinton Foundation emails and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm sure the Clinton campaign w was happy to have a reason to turn the narrative, but, sure. but I do believe it was the timing of the Bannon hire that really uh, expedited the conversations about bringing this into the, into the conversation. But against a bigger backdrop, you've got polls showing minority voters overwhelmingly, especially the African-American population, supporting Hillary Clinton. How can Trump compete for their support, or is he even trying to? 
Right. So uh, conventional wisdom for quite a while has held that Ohio and Pennsylvania in particular, also Florida and North Carolina to some degree, are going to be these sort of pivotal states in this election. What you have is some pockets of black voters that Hillary Clinton would like to turn out, particularly around Jacksonville, Philadelphia, uh, you know, uh, and North Carolina. But for Trump, the issue is making, trying to maximize the number of white voters, including sort of centrist white or slightly right-leaning uh, white voters who will back him. It is that concern that he is trying to address right now uh, in his remarks ostensibly to African-American voters. It is to uh, bring some reassurance to white American voters who are not entirely comfortable uh, with his with these ties uh, to, to the alt-right movement, uh, which she is trying to hammer on at this point. All right. Bloomberg's Margaret Tullivan in Washington. Thank you very much. Still ahead, we're going to hear from legendary investor Mark Mobius on helicopter money and his outlook on Japan. This is Bloomberg. What you miss? Legendary investor Mark Mobius says that helicopter money will be Japan's next big experiment, and it could happen next month. Templeton's executive chairman spoke exclusively with Bloomberg. They will uh, engage in helicopter money with uh, great care and great reluctance. And of course, if they do it too carefully, it won't have the desired effect. This is the dilemma they're facing. Joining us for more is Bloomberg Daybreak Asia co-host Betty Liu. And a lot of people say, Betty, that the push to helicopter money will be if the yen crosses a certain level. Uh, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, what Mark Mobius said was so interesting because, you know, again, he's saying they're going to do it, but it's likely not going to have the desired effect. So why do it at all? That's right? typical of Bank of Japan policy. Isn't that, isn't that how they do it? What is? They, they <laughs> do just, it, but, they do it, not, but nothing they don't happens. really do it. You know, they don't really bring it with their fiscal that's policy. That's not true. No, that's not true. They had that might, might remind you of another, another central bank, by the way. But look, I mean, why do they have to do it? So, as you just said, because the yen continues to strengthen. And uh, what Mark Mobius was saying was that when, if, it hits, if it hits and crosses that 90 yen per dollar level, that that will likely 
be the time that it triggers. Wasn't it like 100 was going to be the big thing and everyone was talking about all the corporates that had hedges at 100 and that was the level? So is it now getting ratcheted down to, well, nothing really happened? As it gradually moves towards this line. Level. Right. Uh, wait until, at some point, wait until it hits the one handle, right? So the three handle, the two handle, and the one handle. Um, what's interesting is, it, like, this phrase, helicopter money, is the phrase that won't go away. Right. And the BOJ governor, um, uh, Kuroda, was asked this by the BBC. You guys remember this, right? Uh, a few months ago. And let's just remind our viewers what he said about this. Basically, fiscal policy is decided by the government and the parliament, while monetary policy is decided and implemented by the central bank. I don't think at this stage we should abandon this institutional setting. No need and no possibility for helicopter money. No possibility. But well, he also said, June? he also said at this stage, no possibility at this stage. It's mixed messaging, right? This is why it continues to haunt well, them. Well, you can't but take away the possibility completely, right? There's still that issue of the fact that helicopter money, in theory, as it's described, would have to involve coordination between the Bank of Japan and the fiscal authorities, which he clearly expressed reservations about that kind of coordination, regardless of whether the conditions have changed. That fundamental structure seems to be disturbed. Right. Uh, there's questions about how much they are on the same page and whether there needs to be more fiscal reform before it, even implementing any type of uh, further easing. So absolutely right. So we'll see. Thanks, Betty. And you can catch Betty with Yvonne Mann at 7 p.m. New York time and 7 a.m. Hong Kong time for Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, which, of course, you can always watch on the Bloomberg. Coming up, what you need to know to gear for tomorrow's trading day. This is Bloomberg. All right, don't miss this. Japan and Tokyo CPI, CPI coming out tonight at 7.30 p.m. And we were talking earlier about the Bank of Japan and helicopter money. Deflation has taken hold. National CPI projected to decline, as well as Tokyo CPI by four-tenths of one percent. It's only when you back out fresh food and energy that you see an increase in prices projected for the month of July. And don't miss this. UK GDP comes out tomorrow at 4.30 in the morning, it's early, it's early, obviously, but I think it's worth getting up because you're gonna get a read on some economics that came in after the Brexit vote. And of course, I'll be looking, as we all will be, at Janet Yellen's speech tomorrow at Jackson Hole at 10 a.m. The title of the speech is the Federal Reserve's Monetary Policy Toolkit, so it should be a fascinating speech and subsequent discussion. 
That's all for What You Missed, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great evening. This is Bloomberg. I'm Alex Wagner. And I'm John Heilman. And with all due respect to Donald Trump, we heard about your Minnesota ballot troubles, and you should have known. A lot of weird stuff happens up there. Oh, yeah. You betcha. <laughs> We got, we got a good show for you tonight. All right. Okay. After a week of being hammered over her family foundation, Hillary Clinton was back on offense today, calling BS on Donald Trump's latest efforts to soften his rhetoric.